Good morning, friends. It's an honor to have you on campus today for our first chapel of the fall 2021 semester. Masks are optional. We want everyone to feel safe and comfortable, so if you have concerns, please speak with an usher. Today we celebrate the first fall chapel in this new facility. We are excited to start another academic year here together. And uh, corporately, we confess that we trust our great God, whatever may come. God is good. And all the time. Amen. Amen. Our chapel services this fall feature music and messages by faculty members and Christian leaders from all around the world. Prayer, campus announcements, and items of general interest are also shared during this community time of rest, relief, and renewal. Today is certainly a special day of encouragement as our semester begins. We have several distinguished groups that are here today that we would like to recognize. First, if you are a new student, would you stand that we might recognize you? And now if you are a returning student, would you please stand? This next group, uh, before I even introduce them, I want to say thank you for your faithful service, and that would be our faculty. If you are a faculty member, would you please stand? And then if you are a guest here joining us today for these festivities, please stand that we may recognize you. <laughs> Well, and to all of you, thank you for joining us on this very special day. In this chapel service, we are here to do two things. First, we are here to worship our great God as we dedicate this building for his glory here at DTS. Second, toward the conclusion of this service, we will unveil the name of this complex the Lord has given us, and we will celebrate with and honor those to whom honor is due. Will you pray with me, please? Heavenly Father, we bow before you and we begin this special occasion, this special celebratory service by thanking you for sending the Lord Jesus to die on the cross, to shed his blood, to pay for our sins, to come back from the dead, and that by simple faith in him, we can have a home in heaven. May we never get beyond, may we never get over the fact that you loved us and now in return, we want to express our love to you. Thank you for this day. Thank you for your grace. We pray these things in the name of the Lord Jesus and in the power of his spirit. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. I will be reading from 1st chap from 1st Samuel chapter 7 verses 7 through 13. Here we discover the wonderful climax to a much larger narrative. Now when the Philistines heard that the people of Israel had gathered at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. When the people of Israel heard of it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the people of Israel said to Samuel, Do not cease to cry out to the Lord for us, that he may save us from the hand of the Philistines. So Samuel took a nursing lamb and offered it up as a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And Samuel cried out to the Lord for Israel. And the Lord answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to attack 
Israel. But the Lord thundered with a mighty sound that day against the Philistines and threw them into confusion. And they were defeated before Israel and the people of Israel went out from Mizpah and, and, and pursued the Philistines and struck them as far as below Bethkar. Hmm. Then Samuel took a stone and he set it up between Mizpah and Shen. He called its name Ebenezer. For he said, Till now, the Lord has helped us. So the Philistines were subdued and did not again enter the territory of Israel. And the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The word of the Lord. In December of 1978, several months into my second grade year, <laughs> my elementary teacher introduced our class to Charles Dickens, A Christmas Carol. Early into the book, we met the crusty, bitter, curmudgeon miser by the name of Ebenezer Scrooge. And as we listened to the opening chapters, our teacher supplemented the text with graphic pictures, which only heightened our fears and anxiety of this nasty man. This was someone you did not want to meet or applaud. Well, not knowing the end of that famed novel as we were only a few short chapters in, we kids deemed him evil and wicked, the enemy of anything good or right, especially Christmas. Well, the very next Sunday, I sat in church with my family when something happened that sent chills down my spine. In shock, horror and disbelief, we sang a song about old Ebenezer. <laughs> and to make matters worse, as I listened to the words of this hymn, apparently we wanted to raise him up, thank him for his help, and arrive safely at his home. <laughs> How dreadful. Thankfully, as the weeks unfolded, clarity came through many resolved questions from the assistance of my folks. Such was my first exposure to the unique name Ebenezer. Well, on this morning, on this occasion, I want to draw our attention to another Ebenezer, one of great importance for us today. The passage of Scripture that Dr. Grant read moments ago, as he said, is part of a much larger story that occurs in 1 Samuel chapters 4 through 7. And that large narrative presents four significant reminders to the reader culminating in the passage that was just read. So I'd like to show us. The four reminders as we think about our gathering today. The larger unit begins in 1 Samuel chapter 4 with the storyline that is both simple and sad. In that passage, Israel went into battle to fight against the Philistines, their arch enemy, and they lost the battle. They tried to rally even retrieving the Ark of the Covenant to lead them into war. But they experienced even more defeat. And at the end of the day, two priests were killed in the Ark of the Covenant. God's symbol among His people was captured. This news was so shocking that when Eli, 
a key priest in Israel, heard the news. He fell backwards out of his chair, broke his neck, and died. The tragic thing about this episode is that Israel, in that context at that time under the law, could not understand that their spiritual decline forfeited their protection from God. What God longed for from Israel was a broken and a contrite heart. What He longed for was a heart that trusted Him, not things that pointed to Him. Israel was trusting a symbol, the Ark of the Covenant, a gold box that represented God's presence among His people. Reminder number one, trust in God, not things that represent God. So now the Philistines had the Ark of the Covenant, and it was a curse for them. Because of that curse, the Philistines in 1 Samuel chapter 6 eventually returned the Ark of the Covenant to Israel. So the Ark was returned to one particular city in Israel, and the people there, the Jews, disrespected the Ark of the Covenant by looking inside, and 70 of them were struck down by the Lord. It was a tragedy for the community. Think of what happened. At first, they trusted in something too much, and now they have no respect for it at all. They disregarded something that was to be a symbol for God, and they treated it as an ordinary object. Reminder number two, honor God, including things that He provides that point to Him. Well, that specific community failed to honor God by disregarding what God had given them to remind them of Him. So because of that great calamity, they sent the ark to another community, and it remained there in obscurity for almost 20 years. And that is where the context of our passage really begins. In 1 Samuel chapter 7, Samuel, the last of the judges and the first of the prophets, is seeking to lead the people to correct their failures. What failures? Their failure to trust in God and their failure to honor the things of God. So Samuel called the people together and said, give your hearts fully to the Lord. Remove anything that stands in the place of the Lord and stand ready to serve Him always. And so they met together and they had a revival of sorts. And they came to the Lord in brokenness and they recommitted themselves to Him. Reminder number three, God approves of humility, and He affirms those that acknowledge complete dependence on Him. Now, as Paul Harvey used to say, here is the rest of the story. This is the climax of this unit, the portion of Scripture that Dr. Grant read moments ago. At that moment of revival, as the people return to a strong covenant relationship with God, the enemy attacked. The Philistines, hearing of their gathering, secretly prepared to attack Israel. And when Israel learned of the coming siege, they, through Samuel, finally cried out to God. And on that day, the day that was marked with trust in God, reverence for what God had provided, and when they came in a heart of humility, on that day, God fought for His people. And as the text said, the Lord thundered against the Philistines. The enemy went into disarray. Israel left the city of Mizpah where the revival had occurred. And they pursued the Philistines, eradicating both their threat and their presence. And then, after the victory, 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 says this. 
Then Samuel took a stone, and he set it up between Mizpah and Shen, and called its name Ebenezer. For he said, till now the Lord has helped us. Notice what Samuel does. To begin, he sets a stone up between Mizpah and Shen. It's obvious what Samuel is doing. He built something equivalent to an altar, a monument, or a marker in order to identify what had happened there. It's not a war memorial remembering the dead, but a memorial remembering the powerful act of a God who is alive. And the stone was placed between Mizpah and Shen. This is fascinating. Mizpah was the place where Israel recommitted herself to Yahweh. A spiritual battle took place there. And Shen, by all accounts, was the place where the physical battle occurred and the Philistines were completely routed. The Ebenezer stone was erected right in the middle as a reminder that behind every physical battle is a spiritual one. So, then Samuel pronounced or called the monument Ebenezer, which literally means the stone of the help or the stone of the helper. That stone of remembrance was given a title to assist the people in recalling God's faithfulness. To them, the word Ebenezer triggered thoughts of God's moment of rescue. The implication is that that specific stone served as a specific reminder of a specific help in a specific battle by a very specific God. Finally, after placing the stone and naming it Ebenezer, the prophet said, till now the Lord has helped us. Or as one translation phrases it, up to here the Lord has helped us. It can possibly imply a geographic marker, God helped us right here, or it can also mean until now, meaning the Lord has helped us this far on our journey. And as Hebrew writers in the Old Testament love to do, it likely means both. In other words, He helped us right here and He helped us get here. As Joyce Baldwin says, that's because the reminder of prayer answered in the past would encourage faith of God in the future. Or as Joseph Hart, the hymn writer, said in 1762, we'll praise Him for all that is past and trust Him for all that is to come. And that brings us, friends, to reminder number four. Commemorate His faithful acts today and trust Him for provision tomorrow. Friends, we gather here today on August the 24th, 2021 to dedicate this building to God. This building is an incredible testimony to the faithfulness of God. It is a demonstration of His power. Here's the story. Through the graciousness of friends of DTS, being prompted by the Lord, funds were provided that allowed the design process to commence, moving us from dream to reality. Over a three-year window, plans were drawn, builders secured, and permits requested. But little did we know that we would have a nine-month delay in securing city authorization due to the tremendous growth in the DFW Metroplex. And as we waited, COVID hit. And on March 15th, the world stopped spinning. Personally, I was quarantined in Israel. Prior to that moment, Dr. Mark Bailey and I, with the assistance of the board, had developed a very smooth transition plan. Working hand in glove, we planned to hand the baton in seamless manner. And then COVID brought untold challenges on all of us. And Dr. Bailey and I both remarked 
that neither of us in our formal studies had ever taken a class entitled Seminary Leadership Transitions in a Global Pandemic. <laughs> Not knowing the fiscal implications of the pandemic, we had very tough meetings. We had the unpleasant task of designing, listen close, a potential 10, 20, and 30 percent budget cut for an institution that we love. If we had to go that direction, it would be painful laying off over a hundred faithful employees. And wouldn't you know it, four weeks into the pandemic, with the world on pause, and by the way, do you remember being glued to your television watching every press conference? <laughs> with the world on pause during that moment, wouldn't you know it, that's when we received official permission to commence construction on a $14 million building project. All the time thinking, we may have to make the largest budget cut in DTS history. The question was, what to do? The board knew the severity of the moment. Dr. Bailey knew the severity of the moment. I knew the severity of the moment. How could we move forward with a potential layoff coming? What to do? The battle in front of us was great. It was almost insurmountable. In a scheduled Zoom call meeting with the board, God literally drove us to our knees. I will never forget that picture and I will never forget that moment. In that specifically called meeting, we prayed and committed to pray more for wisdom and direction. After a week of fasting and prayer, we met again. And the Lord had confirmed in each one of us the desire to move forward. The Lord confirmed to each woman and man that the mission had not changed that now more than ever before, we are called to equip godly servant leaders for the proclamation of His Word and the building up of the body of Christ worldwide. And on that day, the board, the administration, submitted in one mind and heart and with great confidence to God, we committed to trust Him all over again and to give this project to Him. And we confess that without Him, it would not happen. And we moved forward in faith. Friends, we gather here on August the 24th, 2021 to dedicate this building to God, but we would do well to recall the reminders from God's Word. Today, we trust in God, not in a building. We honor Him, but treat with reverence that which He has provided. We acknowledge our complete dependence on God and confess that without Him, we can do nothing. And we remember His faithful acts today and confidently trust Him with our tomorrows. We are here acknowledging God's miraculous provisions and direction. Not only did we not have to lay anyone off over a year ago, but the Lord provided strong funding this last year. The Lord provided record enrollment this last year, and again as we roll into it, this one. And this building, it was ahead of time and under budget. And by the way, had we waited to build it would have cost 42% more. You see, friends, had the Lord not led, we would not be having this service today. This structure that we are in reminds us that God is still active in this present world and in our present circumstances. It stands as a marker in Dallas, Texas, daily passed by thousands of city patrons as a testimony to the faithfulness of God, His inerrant Word, and the good news of a Savior that paid the price for our sins, conquered death, gives life anew, and grants life eternal. 
This building is a monument to God. It stands as a physical reminder of a battle where God fought for us. So I know this room of faith, and all those watching online can profess with me, Lord, You brought us this far. And as somebody once said, He didn't bring us this far to leave us. He didn't teach us to swim to let us drown. He didn't build a home in us to move away. He didn't lift us up to let us down. You see, friends, this building is an Ebenezer, and I don't mean Scrooge. God's faithfulness is so amazing, isn't it? As uh, the vice chairman of the Board of Incorporate Members, it's my privilege to be able to stand here today and celebrate with you the opening of this wonderful facility. As a board, uh, we are entrusted with envisioning the future. And this wonderful facility is a great step in that future. Even challenging days, uh, maybe especially in challenging days, our mission has not changed. Dr. Yarborough said it, but our mission is to equip godly servant leaders for the proclamation of his word and the building up of the body worldwide. And that's what we're still about. This new chapel and student center, part of that mission, is a great addition to the DTS campus and in fact, to the whole area of Dallas. It changed the entire landscape of the campus here. I don't know if you thought about it, but thousands of people drive down Live Oak, going towards downtown every day, and they see that brick monument that's out there with the name of Dallas Theological Seminary on it, and it is an introduction to them of who we are. The cross that sits on the cupola above us, um, it's a sign that we are about things that are eternal. You know, I've walked around this building. I'm reminded that it is a product of many years of planning and construction. Uh, There's a plaque that's outside the the doors here, and it has the name of uh, donors on that those of you who have given sacrificially. We're grateful for each and every name on that plaque. Many of you are here today, and we could not have done it without you. So to you, we say thank you. As we gather today on this first week of the fall 2021 semester, we're thankful for those who have shared our vision. But even more, we want to give glory to God for his direction and his provisions. As Dr. Yarborough said, this is an Ebenezer. It commemorates God's faithfulness. So as we dedicate this building, uh, may we always remember the purpose of training men and women to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. As Jesus said in Matthew 5, 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and praise your Father in heaven. Now, as we uh, commence with the ceremonial ribbon cutting, I'd like to ask the following people to come up on stage and participate. So I'm going to read the names off. As I'm reading the names off, if they would just come and, and, and stand here, that would be great. Dr. Mark Bailey, Chancellor of DTS. 
Dr. Herman Baxter, DTS Dean of Students. Mr. Mike, uh, Mr. Mike Gakey, uh, Executive Director, and if you saw the way it's spelled, you'd understand why I stumbled on that, by the way. <laughs> Executive Director of Maybe Foundation. Uh, Dr. Reg Grant, Chair and Senior Professor of Media Arts and Worship. Mr. Jalen Lee, DTS Student Council President. Mr. Glenn Monroe, Executive Director of Facilities and Event Services. Mr. Robert Murkison, the Chair of the DTS Board of Incorporate Members. Mrs. Trina Murray from 5M Foundation. Mr. Robert Riggs, DTS Vice President for Operations. And Dr. Mark Yarborough, President of DTS. So these, these individuals here represent different parts of our constituencies. Uh, they represent you and all of those of you who are viewing online at this great moment. Uh, once the ribbon has been cut, our Chancellor Emeritus, Dr. Chuck Swindoll, will lead us in a dedicatory prayer. So without delay, let's get this ribbon cut. Um, upon the official opening, let's give great applause to the Lord and then let's pray. Please remain standing for the prayer of dedication. My words specify the chapel especially, but it would also include, of course, the student center as well. Bow with me, please, as we go before the Lord. O Lord, our God, we stand before you on this day. And we acknowledge that you and you alone are the object of our worship. We declare that you and you alone are the center of our praise. We thank you that you and you alone are the giver of every good and perfect gift that comes from you, the Father of heaven. One of the most recent of these gifts is this chapel in which we stand in the student center adjacent to it. How grateful we are for the building that you have provided, for the essential role it fills in the lives of those on this campus who are in training for a lifetime of ministry. In this very room, we will often gather to quiet our hearts to confess our sins, to renew our minds, to sing our praises, to release our anxieties, to seek and find comfort in our trials and grief, to enlarge and deepen our friendships with one another, and especially to hear the truths of your word as they are faithfully proclaimed. In this very room, O oh God, we will meet with you. For this reason, this chapel can become the single most significant place on the campus. Therefore, on this day, we dedicate it to you as well as the student center where students will often meet. May these places become a place where students find refuge and renewal, just as Bethel became that for Abraham. May these rooms and spaces become the place where students gather for prayer 
and waiting on you as David waited patiently on the Lord and you turned to him and heard his cry. May this building become a place where students find release, relief and reassurance in the midst of being tested, enduring pressure as Daniel endured when he bowed down before you three times a day with his windows open toward Jerusalem. May this room become a place of solitude and strength as Paul found when he went away into Arabia where you met with him alone to reveal your will. We dedicate this chapel and the student center to you today. We also ask that you will bless especially and use our chaplain, Joe Allen. May he shepherd the flock, the students of Dallas Seminary, from one year to the next. May he bring encouragement and comfort to those in need of his counsel and seasoned wisdom. Keep Chaplain Allen strong. Give him mercy and patience and understanding. How grateful we are for his presence among us. May his walk with you be a reminder of what it means to minister to others in grace. And therefore, our Father, it is in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we dedicate this chapel and this student center to you. And we make these requests before you on this very day. Through Christ, we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Again, all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, I'm going to go off script here for a minute because I want to welcome, I want to thank uh, several people who played such an integral role that God used in uh, building uh, this facility. And I'd like to uh, ask them to stand up if they're here. Uh, Kim Till, Robert Riggs, and Glenn Monroe, and anybody that's on their team. If they would stand up, please. Uh, my name is Robert Murkison, and I am honored to serve as uh, the chairman of the Board of Incorporate Members of Dallas Theological Seminary. And I am honored to speak this morning on behalf of my brothers and sisters on the board, uh, both current and former. And if you are on the Board of Incorporate Members, or previously or now, would you please stand up? Uh, besides dedicating this uh, building to the uh, Lord, we are also here to honor some special service, uh, servants. Uh, Barbie and Mark Bailey, would you please come up to the podium? It's been too long, uh, but today we're finally honoring the Baileys for their 35 years of service to Dallas Seminary. Uh, due, to, due to COVID restrictions last Jan uh, June the 30th, members of the seminary family were only able to bid them farewell as they walked to their car on a hot summer day. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, therefore, we have set aside this day to dedicate this facility to the Lord and to honor Barbie and Mark Bailey. Mark, you have held many positions on this campus. Professor, Vice President of Academic Affairs, Academic Dean, Provost, and the seminary's fifth president uh, for 19 years, and now Chancellor. Uh, you have been a blessing uh, to this institution. Your gentle, kind, and humble heart and demeanor, and your constant, steady, servant leadership will leave an indelible mark on Dallas Theological Seminary. And by your side through these years, your wife Barbie has served you, and she has served the seminary family. Barbie, you've certainly been an asset to the seminary. Your commitment in ministry as a couple is an example to everyone in this room. Mark, in your new role as chancellor, we look forward to continuing to work with you and to see you influence the lives of many. May I draw your attention now to the screens for the official unveiling of the outside of the building. So on this day, Tuesday, October 24, 2021, on behalf of the board and corporate members, the administration, faculty and staff, of, and the entire seminary community, I am pleased to announce the name of this new facility. It will henceforth be called the Bailey Student Center and Chafer Chapel. Dr. Bailey would like to say a few words. She said to let you know I made her stand up here with me. <laughs> <laughs> Psalm 115.1 is very appropriate for this day. Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory because of your loving kindness and because of your truth. The DNA of DTS has always been deeper than any one of its leaders. We who have had the privilege to serve the mission of the seminary know full well that ours is a gospel to guard, a heritage to appreciate, a stewardship to manage, a trust to protect, a vision to advance, and a community to shepherd. Mark and I did not plan this, but two scrolls with Chinese characters, graced the mantle of Hudson Taylor in his home in China. He was the founder of the China Inland Mission. The calligrapher's playful stroke of bamboo brush dipped into the lamp black ink, the, uh, the lamp black ink, and drops of water on Huan paper concealed the mastery and artistry behind seemingly two simple words. The Chinese calligraphy depicted two names that reminded Taylor of God's provision, Ebenezer, and Jehovah Jireh, which we now know is better pronounced in Hebrew, Yahweh Yara. These two memorial names come from, as you heard this morning, 1 Samuel chapter 7 and verse 12, the other from Genesis 22 and verse 14. The first, I memorized in King James as a boy, hitherto hath the Lord led, or hitherto hath the Lord helped us. More in modern translation, this far, the Lord has helped us. The second is the Lord will provide. One looked back while the other one looked forward. One reminded of God's faithfulness and the other of God's assurance for what he will do through the promise of his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus reminds us in the parable, so too, when you have done everything you were commanded to do, you're to say something. And we together, as a couple, we say it together. We are unworthy servants. We've only done what we were supposed to do. We ministry leaders, Paul Tripp writes, are given way too much credit for the results of our ministry, and we should all resist it. Mm -hmm. 
And believe me, I tried. <laughs> the board overruled. People tend to think that we have more power and wisdom than we actually have, he writes. Ministry success is a testament to who God is and what he's willing to do through us by grace. We're tools in the hand of one awesome power, glory, grace, and nothing more. The gospel institutions that we have the privilege to build or have been built by his power and grace. So they stand, as you've heard throughout the morning, as a monument to his presence and his glory and not to us. Romans 11.36 so powerfully says it, from him and through him and to him are all things. And Barbie and I would like to say to him be the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. On behalf of Dr. Yarbrough, the board, the chancellors, and we, the friends, faculty, students, and members of DTS, we're so honored that you gather with us today and online around the world. Let us pray. Father, we do give you praise from all nations and from all peoples. We thank you for your faithfulness, your love towards us. Be glorified this day. In Jesus' name, amen.